Hello and welcome. My name is Minhaj and I'm the CEO of Saidab. Today I have uh, with me uh, Dr. Mark. Um, thank you so much for being here, doctor. Absolute pleasure, Minhaj. Good evening to you. Uh, good evening to you all. And I don't know if that's too late to say Happy New Year. <laughs> you, yeah, you certainly can. Um, it's, a bit, it's an interesting year to start in, um, but Happy New Year to you too and to your listeners. Thanks. Um, now, Mark, you are an honorary professor of um, extreme medicine um, at medical school um, at University of Exeter. You wear a lot of caps, uh, and we're going to be talking about that uh, today. Um, but before that, what I find really interesting is that when I think of extreme, I think of extreme winter, um, extreme summer, um, and all these tasteful connotations of the word extreme. Uh, but when I put it together with medicine, the only thing that I can think of is the overdose or substance abuse. And I'm sure that's not what you do. So what does extreme medicine actually mean? Well, I think um, you're sort of, um, if you'd been saying extreme medicine 20 years ago, you'd have been absolutely right. It would have been kind of extreme uh, overdoses. It would have been sort of extreme um, parasites, that sort of stuff. But um, about 20 years ago, we started um, coalescing different fields of medicine um, to address the the environments you were talking about at the beginning. So the extremely cold, the extremely hot, the extremely arid. Um, for us, extreme medicine also goes into into space. So you know the extremes in terms of you know, gravity, in terms of uh, operating in a potential vacuum. It's taking uh, what well, what we do is is essentially prepare train and um and try and provide opportunities for medical professionals be they nurses or paramedics or doctors to work in some of the world's most remote uh, at times extreme but also at times dangerous locations so working within civilian expeditions working in or responding to sudden onset disasters like earthquakes uh, tidal waves as such working in a, in a military context, working as a military medic um, and working sort of in an expeditionary sense in terms of working at the North Pole, the South Pole, uh, you know, those obvious extremes of the extremely hot and, the, and extremely high and extremely cold. Interesting. Now, coming to your own background, you are fellow for both Royal Society of Geography as well as Arts in um, they seem to be as different from each other as the poles that you have just mentioned. So how did you actually cross paths with medicine? Well, I suppose my original degree was in, in geography, and that's always been my passion, especially, especially physical geography. And I guess that's where my love of expeditionary life comes from, is that sort of love of being outdoors. It's a love of exploring mountains and coastlines, you know, and our physical environment. Now, the Royal Society of Art, arts rather is slightly misleading so it's not uh, paintings and art per se it's about the um, social environment it's about human psychology the social anthropology of of the way that our societies and the world work so it's it's a bit more expansive and actually ties into the my geography background but also ties into um, medicine you know medicine used judiciously has an, in, an incredibly uh, important play to part in our global society as well as our domestic societies and you know the future of humanity in some regards rests on our ability to adapt and overcome with the medicine we have to our hand you know and as uh, as we attempt to land on the moon and make a permanent base on the moon and perhaps go further on to mars the medicine we need to carry with us needs to adapt to those those changing environments and those extreme environments. So, you know, medicine, society, and, and actually, to be honest, geography in some regards are, are really all highly interlinked and uh, and mutually inclusive. So, I guess my my broad interest is um, in in is how sort of medicine can help society largely. What I particularly find interesting about your work is that. You seem to me a person who think not only the scientific um, or the medical aspect of sciences, but then you see art in that also. 
with all the pictures that you've taken and then you're going to be having having a look on it um further down in the interview do you also think that you know there is a there is a abstract beauty um in the science um especially in different geographies that you can find around the world i think there's an incredible beauty in in science but also in in the natural world obviously i think um perhaps the bit that makes me um, really get a lot out of taking photographs and creating images in that way is a bit that also allows me to be creative. And I think the my original training in geography allows me to, to look at things rather than um, immersing too deeply in the detail, actually stepping back a little bit, which enables me then to see the way that links can be made between different disciplines and the way that we can sort of, we can improve. Um, the way that we deliver remote medicine in, in, in extreme conditions. I think um, a lot of this beauty requires a lot of alone time to contemplate. We know that from Toro's work and uh, Ralph Emerson Waldo, and you have been someone who has gone quite far um, in terms of finding secluded places. Um, you have lived quite some years in um, a place called Abisko, uh, which is within 250 kilometers Arctic Circle. Um, I myself has um, studied quite close, as not as north as you, uh, but in a city called Umeå in Sweden, uh, where I studied for my master's. Um, extreme cold weather gets to minus 25, 30, and I assume that's even higher in Abisko. Even for people who live in northern in Sweden, Abisko is kind of a no-go zone. So it's just like too cold for the people who are already living in the north of Sweden and you have lived there for quite some time and what's so amazing about that is that you have worked with dog sledges and I mean, what was the experience like? Well I suppose it's fair to say that I didn't live there but I, I went there every every winter season to to go dog sledding so um, for a long time almost 20 years I or rather should we say 15 years on a sort of almost full-time basis I was leading expeditions or um running trips to the arctic and and working as you said with with dog teams and i did about 15 years um of working with dog teams and local guides to do trips in the high arctic and i would generally go up there for about um three or four weeks uh, at a time and then often i would then come back to the uk to go down to antarctica and work in antarctica working as a naturalist and a boat driver for some of the expedition ships so I had a uh, quite a strong affinity for working in cold places, but I think it's the beauty of it. And also, I absolutely love working with dogs. And I think solitude is important, but I actually have to say that I'm quite social. So to be completely sol uh, solo, I, w I actually personally find quite difficult. I need to be with somebody. I need to have some interaction. But to a degree, the interaction and the relationship you build with the dogs that you're working with can go some way to assaging that sense of isolation because they've very much got different personalities and the way that you respond to them is based upon your personality or your relationship that you have with them as individual dogs because they all have very different uh personalities some are you know some are shy and quite withdrawing some are boisterous and affectionate some are hard working and solid some are you know quite lazy and you have to keep an eye on them to keep them going so you know within your group of group of dogs and it would depend how far you're going how many dogs you would have sometimes you know sometimes quite often you would have just six if you go for a short journey but if you're doing a longer journey you'd have 12 dogs and that's 12 individual personalities and not only do you have do they have a relationship clearly with you but they also have a relationship with each other you know and there's a pecking order and some dogs don't get on with the other dogs or the other dogs really you know it's it's personality driven so that does go to go quite a long way to assaging that sense of isolation well, I think that is probably part of the art that you were talking about earlier, you know, handling not only people, um, but dogs also, and you know, getting them to do things that um, they sometimes want to do, sometimes they don't. Um, I um, understand that you also have a souvenir from at that time um, back home. You brought one of them home. Uh, yeah. Is it her? What's the name? Yes. So her name is Anya, and she's, uh, yeah, I bought her home eight years ago. I guess... Do you know, I, mean, I guess at the after 15 years, I kind of got a bit tired of getting frozen every winter. So I decided actually, let me bring a, a bit of the Arctic back that I really love and bring it bring it home because my kids absolutely adore 
um, and yeah, and it's been a massive part of their upbringing. But it also then allowed me to go to actually do some other types of trips in that sort of winter period and go off to go off to other places and and start doing other things as well because 15 years is quite a long time to dog, dog studying and it was incredibly rewarding and I you know try and go back up when I can but it's also good to, to spice it up and have some variety. Mm. Well, as someone who's traveled quite a lot also in um, Africa and Middle East um, and pretty much um, all Europe, I mean, back when I was young, you know, you used to hitchhike, backbike um, all over the place. And I was just wondering, um, there are some things uh, that are very common um, in travelers um, and something that actually bring them back home. Uh, for some, it's friendships. For some, it's love. For some, it's nostalgia and simple uh, responsibilities. So. Um, you just mentioned you have children also what is that one thing that you know that always brings brings you back well i <laughs> to be honest i'm a solo parent so uh, i one of one of the reasons why um extreme medicine has grown so much is actually in order to be a parent i needed to be here so you know i've cut back on doing quite so many expeditions and i have for the last sort of decade or so although i've also taken my children with me on a number of trips but obviously um, that also relies on, time, relies on time off from school. So I think the thing that draws me back every single time is my children. Um, I think if uh, if I didn't have kids, then I perhaps would be far more peripatetic. I may not even be living in England now, but um, yeah, kids. And, and actually, Britain is a, is a fantastically beautiful place when you've got the weather to see it. Um, well, I guess most people would um, disagree in the sense that, you know, they find it very foggy and rainy. Um, the whole time, which doesn't probably have the, uh, sorry for, you know, bragging, we have all four <laughs> and <laughs> different fruits and things like that. So it's, um, it's not a fair comparison, but I was just wondering, um, that, uh, you have been to some of very opposite environments. Um, you've been to Oman, um, during work, um, with green medicine and that's, um, a desert. I mean, I live in a city, um, which is quite close to desert, um, and gets around 49, 50, um, in the summer. So I was just wondering on one hand, you've been doing the dog sledge thing. And then on the other hand, you know, you went all the way to the desert. Um, so how, how do you actually cope with that? I think, um, I mean, in many respects, uh, the Arctic and Antarctica are considered to be deserts as well, physiologically, because there isn't much accessible water. So actually, you know, what falls is frozen. So from a physiological point of view, they're both cons considered to be deserts. So maybe it's the the you know the desert extremes that that really sort of that I'm attracted to. But deserts are my favorite environment, actually. And I'd rather I get more. I can immerse myself in a desert in a way that I can, that I don't in sort of Arctic environments. And I've spent quite a lot of time in various deserts, including, as you mentioned, sort of Oman and also the Yemen and then the River Khali in southern Saudi Arabia, but also the Namib Nauklift in Namibia. Um, and I'm just absolutely, and, and Rajasthan as well, absolutely fascinated by deserts, not only by the people that inhabit those deserts, but also the you know the biome as well in terms of the plant life and the and the animal life the insect life it's also perfectly formed for living in those environments and perfectly adapted then they're just a miracle to le look at each each different one but on one of my trips they were there was an extremely close um turnover between one trip and the other and the first trip was in Timbuktu and I was at about sort of plus 35 there, 45. And I was pretty comfortable with that. That was okay, but it was hot. And I'm, you know, I'm used to traveling and quite fit and stuff. And I thought, you know, I'm going to go to, and then I had to go to London, change bags, change from desert stuff to polar kit and then go up to the, the Arctic, you know, within a 24 hour period. And I thought that'll be fine. I'll cope with that fine. But I actually found going from, uh, what it must be plus 35 to sort of minus 15 was actually quite taxing on my body and actually the first couple of days were quite quite a strain actually just getting used to, your mind's fine your mind flicks from one to the other because you're used to working in those environments but sometimes your body does take a couple of days just to catch up um but i have to say i love both environments but i would i'm fa absolutely fascinated by deserts and you know quite happy to spend months and months of living in and i'm, I'm a, born a slight geek in so much as i can quite often um if i go into people's houses and i see and they've got different pictures of their desert trips uh, 
often you can tell which desert it just by merely looking at the color, the the color, the texture, the type of sand. You can almost, you can often, well, I can often tell which desert it is, which is a bit nerdy, but it is. I think just reflects how much I enjoy being there. Yeah, I think that would freak a lot of people out that, you know, be mere sp you know, spying on them or, you know, how could you actually tell something which is very granular. Um, so that could be a voodoo uh, or at least perceived as a voodoo in some places, I guess. It's a slight, uh, slight nerdy super skill, which doesn't do me much good and much time. But, um, you know, obviously the geology underlying these deserts is very different because um, what defines them is the, the climatic conditions rather than the geology. So, you know, the rocks that form the sand give different colors, textures, crystal sizes, you know, all sorts of um, small differences, which, you know, if, you've immer if you have been in a particular desert for a long time, they become very distinctive. I think um, some of the um, pictures that you actually took um, on your journey, then you have also been a published uh, photographer um, on um, National Geographic. So let's have a, a look actually on um, some of your pictures. And if you could just tell us where was this? I mean, that's for sure the dog sled, right? Yeah, this is February up in, um, in fact, not so far north. This is uh, the Hardvanger Plateau, which is, um, uh, I'm going to say central Norway. I'm not sure it's entirely central, but it's, it's really quite high. Interesting enough, this is where they filmed one of the Star Wars. Um, it's also where Shackleton, uh, Scott, and Amundsen, I think I've got all of that, certainly Scott and Amundsen trained for their South Polar journeys. It's, an, it's, a, it's a high plateau in Norway, which um, just gets a heavy, heavy dump of snow. And it's, you know, it's very reliable in terms of the amount of snow. Again, it's quite uh, remote. You can only get into that environment by using a train. And the train doesn't always make it through. Often the track will get... Um, will get closed by snow drifts or small avalanches and stuff. And this is uh, heading, this is actually an expedition medicine training course. So we're heading out the dog sets to get people used to working in that environment. The medicine, you know, is slightly different from medicine, the type of medicine people will be doing elsewhere, but it's not so different. What makes extreme medics extreme is the fact they're able to do that medicine in these environments. You know, they're able to cope with the fact everything's frozen and the kit is all over the place. Um, and that's what we're teaching them. Really, in some respects, it's the medicine, yes, but it's also the, the, the logistics and the ability to to be efficient in these environments and survive in these environments. Mm -hmm. I think that we absolutely have a lot to talk about when it comes to uh, mental preparedness and how to actually cope with um, such extreme situations. But let's go through some of the other pictures that you have taken. Um, where was that? So this is in Georgia. This is looking at the, I can't, to be honest, I can't remember the name of that mountain, but it's a Caucasus range. If you're, as you're looking at that picture, as your viewers, to the left-hand side would be um, Elbrus, so one of the highest mountains in the world. And this is the back end of the Caucasus. Um, and this is a trek we were doing in, in Georgia, which is one of the most remarkable countries in the world. Through my work, I get to, I've got, I've got a number of friends who work as astronauts. Um, and I told them I was going to Georgia and they said, oh, it's we've never actually been. But the, our, our favorite food is Georgian food, because obviously when they were going to Kazakhstan and you taking using um, the Russian vehicles to get up to the International Space Station, they would be exposed to different types of um, food, you know, Russian food, Georgian food, Kaz Kazakhstan food, et cetera, et cetera. And I kind of thought I dismissed it as being maybe just a slight sort of exaggeration, but I have to say the Georgian food was absolutely amazing and was some of my um, most favorite food as well. It's it's just an incredible country and one that I'm looking forward to, to revisiting quite soon once we get on the other side of the COVID pandemic. And then we have penguins. Yeah, so these are emperor penguins down on South Georgia at a place called King Edward Point. So South Georgia is a group of islands that sit to the north of Antarctica, um, kind of, kind of, but not quite between there and the tip of South America. They're slightly mm. further off I to think the east. The the feature that in the, the Planet movie also uh, on Netflix. <clears throat> More than likely, and this is where Shackleton's final resting place. If you. Um, Remember Shackleton's amazing escape from Antarctica, where he took the James Caird, the open rowing boat, essentially across the Southern Ocean in, in an amazing feat of not only 
teamwork and navigation and survival this is essentially where he landed he landed just around the the other side of the island and then had to do frustratingly another trek over a number of passes to get to Gritviken, which is where the big whaling station was um, and the relics of the whaling station are very much still there and the one that i saw was narrated by david attenborough and then um, this island is the one which is temperate enough for all the penguins to actually um, go and breed. Uh, and feed the yeah, children. and it's a, it's, a, it's a big seal breeding um, location and, and, and other birds as well. Um, yeah, it's really quite an amazing, amazing place, actually. One of, one, of world, one of the world's most incredible wonders, to be honest, because the scenery and the wildlife is amazing. Well, a uh, very... Um, um, less scenic place that you were um is uh, mm -hmm. i don't know where that is <laughs> so this is exploring the catacombs so this is central paris and this is i, I don't remember which road but it's one of uh, paris's major roads the catacombs underneath paris essentially to build paris they and they they um they dug stone from beneath what is now the modern city to build it the cities above and in the process built a drainage system a sewage system underneath the city but the catacombs in paris then were used to bury the bed bury the dead or rather uh put the skeletons down there so you see also there are ossuaries down there um but the catacombs them, themselves goes on go on for hundreds of kilometers i mean they're really very very extensive and it's not so easy to find your way into them but if you've got somebody who can guide you then um, you can spend days down there, and a lot of the the catacombs or the you know the underground pathways mirror the old uh, city plan above. So down below, you'll find pathways and passageways which are named have street names, and above that might well be the the same street name. But of course, the city above has also changed. So you'll get these these. Uh, pathways below which have a certain name and of course the road above has changed or been dis or has disappeared so you know it's all it's a almost like a historical blueprint of the city above you know and there are museums it's just an incredible there are old museums dug into the cave down there there are bits where clearly people used to live there's a resistance bunker that's in the in the catacombs but it is a labyrinth so you need somebody and it's very easy to get lost in there. So you do need uh, a guide or somebody who knows their way around, way around to sort of guide you through it because it is hundreds of kilometres of, pa of passageways with no references. There's no, you know, lights or anything. So it's all sort of by torch, um, quite a tricky place. But this is, anyway, this is emerging. I think this is probably about 2 o'clock in the mor morning, emerging into the Paris sort of main street. And the odd thing about being in a big city is nobody even looked at us. And we were literally covered in clay and you know, quite sweaty. And, and nobody gave us a, sick, a, a second look. And the people that did realised actually, oh, you've been down the catacombs. How was it? And it's quite, a, it's quite an experience. And um, what if you actually get lost um, down there? Do you have a GPS or something or anything at all? Just people coming for you? <laughs> No, the GPS obviously won't work down there because you can't see the sky because it's satellite driven. So if you got lost down there, you would, yeah, you would be in a tricky, tricky situation actually because, I mean, there are, there's not just one way in. There are a multitude of different ways, but quite often what you'll find is you'll, you'll, you know, you'll find your way through to what looks like an exit, but as you get closer to the surface, you know, the the exit is locked or there's something. Um, a vehicle's parked on it, so you can't open the the manhole cover. So you, yeah, it's it's it wouldn't be a good idea to get lost down there because it is literally a labyrinth. And as soon as your torch runs out, it's pitch black. Oh, a lot can go wrong. Uh, a lot could go wrong. But but I guess now is the time to um, you know test your knowledge about the desert um, that you were talking about earlier uh, with the texture and everything. So what place is that? So this is the Wahibi Sands in um, Oman, and I mean, I took the picture, so, so it's a, a bit of an easy one. But, um, you know, it's very... I wouldn't be able to notice anyway, so... <laughs> well, it's just very characteristic, because it's very iron-rich, so it's very red, red sand. I mean, obviously, it's it looks like it's a morning or evening shot, so that redness is even deeper. But also, it's got these very kind of very distinctive wind ripples on it. 
Um, and of course, you do get that elsewhere, but the combination of of the type of ripples and the redness of the sand does make it, you know, one of, you know, cuts down the number of places it could be, certainly. Okay. And you've gotten yourself seemingly in quite precarious positions also. So where was that? Well, this is our friend. This was last year. This is in the Simeon Mountains in um, Ethiopia. So we'd actually come up a route um, that hadn't really been walked by Europeans for for quite well for tens of years already so we were walking a route that really wasn't um very well known at all and quite the simian mountains are essentially on a as by description there are a range of mountains but there's a plateau on top with um with a unique sort of cultural identity and farming identity but because we came in um via a, a very remote route then we we got to engage with some incredible people up on the top of this plateau um, you know, Ethiopia gets cold. I mean, it's, you don't think of Ethiopia as being one of those places, but it's extremely cold. It's pretty at your altitude, so you're at three and a half thousand, four thousand meters. Not really, really high, but certainly high enough for that to be, you know, to for your breathing to be affected. Um, and as we entered the national park of the Simeon Mountains, then um, we got given an armed guard. I think, to be honest, although. Ethiopia clearly suffers from some um, internal conflicts and external conflicts. You know, weapon carrying there is often as much a uh, status symbol, a, a status symbol, rather than the fact that there's a, a massive threat. Um, so, but this um, chap was with us for three or four days, and he was kind of our our local guide, our protector. He was a great guy. So do you always need people like this um, on your journey? <laughs> No, you don't always, but I think it's that um, I think there's always a distinct value because otherwise you miss so much in terms of interpretate interpreting the landscape, and having somebody local who knows the area, you know, they can tell you stuff that you could never find out otherwise. You could never read in a book, or you could never you could never surmise from your own observation. So, um, having you know local people there with you gives a, a very much deeper experience and also you know opens up whole lines of communication that you wouldn't otherwise have i think a lot of our um, presumptions um, and apprehensions prevent us from experiencing something something which is very exquisite um and unique in nature for example um last year i was in um, africa and we drove to the south sudanese border which borders with uganda and, and on the left side you've got congo um and i have never ever seen in my life a border uh, which is simply an unpaved road and on the right side it's congo on the left side <laughs> it's uganda and straight up it's sudan and you know people were just crossing and hands and dogs and donkeys and it was just like the most unpatrolled border but uh, the people were just so welcoming and hospitable and um, natural that it, it's such a sight. Um, if that's something that, you know, you come back home and explain to people, it, it, for them, it's it's very dangerous. So what if you get Ebola and things like that? And I'm just wondering if you have this experience trying to explain those beautiful things to people who would be very apprehensive of such experiences. Well, I think it, we, we came across it most evidently when um, I first wanted to take my children on expeditions. And, you know, my youngest daughter was five months old when we first went to the Namib Desert, um, and my son was six months old. And we, you know, we faced, or not faced, but we certainly got um, some comments about, you sure it's safe to take your children there? You know, isn't it? it are, you, are, you, are you being responsible? You know, and my, my first response is, well, you know, funny enough, in all of these places, children exist. People have children. But clearly, it's safe enough for them. It's safe enough for us. But also, you know, in a in, in a country like the UK, where it's crowded, where quite often, in order to get your children somewhere to school or what have you, you have to put them in vehicles. Do you know, we were out in the middle of the 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 desert with our kids, and there was no vehicles, nowhere for us to have a road traffic accident, accident, no electricity, you know, electricity sockets for them to put their hands in. Of course, there were there were snakes and stuff around, but you've just got to take um, sensible precautions, just like the people who live there with their own children take. 
Um, so we came across it then most evidently with, you know, you can't possibly take your children there. It's, it's impossible. But actually, of course, we did. And the kids, uh, well, there were a couple of things. Kids really enjoyed it, of course. But we also really enjoyed sharing the experience with our children. And what I found was that places that I'd been to before, I saw those places with their eyes again. So I, I felt that the powerful uh, excitement that they have in see, seeing these places, which, you know, become rather blasé if you've been there a number of times, but, but it was incredible to, to, to feel that again. But also having children or traveling with children opens up doors that would never open up to you, as, especially as a single man. You know, people were so welcoming. It wasn't, just wasn't true. Um, you know, and quite often we would be doing. Uh, I remember one occasion in Brazil where we were doing the same circuit with some trekking uh, clients, and um, and so the children would be in the Land Rover and actually be driven forward, and then you know we would walk with the clients over the mountains, through the forest, and all that sort of stuff. But we, the point being, we we would go back to similar farms or small villages where we'd have campsites, you know, every week. And of course, our children were, were the only English children for about a thousand kilometers. So you know, quite often I'd get into where our camp was or the village and not see them for a couple of hours because they'd been taken off to see the chickens or they were going off to play. So, you know, it, it's a remarkable experience traveling with young children, not only for you, not only for them, but also the way that you travel. It's very different. Well, I'm glad your children had um, these experiences. Um, you as a father who wasn't very... Um, protective, uh, or at least say, um, conservative um, in protecting them from experiences that some people would deem very um, dangerous. But let's go back in time and talk about your own childhood. Um, and um, I just wonder who inspired you to become an explorer or think about um, things from a very different perspective. So you have this, you know, mercurial a nature within you to go out and see the world and um, explore what's out there. There's a site, there's a, and I, and I don't have the paper, but there's a scientific America study or there's a study in the States that suggests, and I can't remember the exact nature of the, of the, of the paper that suggests that people who live near coastlines have a particular gene that people live who live inland don't. And the premise was, that historically those people who are driven by the the way the way their body chemistry works to be explorers and to go to that far horizon would end up congregating by the sea because that's where they would then have to do that i oh, was certainly in the uk anyway they would the next leg of their journey would always have to be by water so consequently you know, you have a predominance of this particular gene in coastal areas. And I was brought up in one of those coastal areas and my father was a captain at sea. So I think biologically it's in me to travel. And I think the fact that I, my children, I've got one at university and I've got one going in the, uh, the year afterwards. And initially I was kind of, I was a little bit threatened by the fact that my kids who were the, who'd been the focus of my life for the last sort of 10, 15 years, we're suddenly leaving the house and that's kind of is all going to be, but then I realized actually it's an opportunity, a massive opportunity for me to get back into doing expeditions. And actually the drive that I had to do expeditions early on is, is undiminished. And I still want to do lots of long treks and, and journeys and stuff. So I think some of it is actually it's in you or it, or it isn't in you. Um, I also lived, as I said, I met, I was brought up in a coastal uh, town where the, um, you know the history of Scott as an explorer and various explorers was quite was quite deeply ingrained because quite often this was the port. So that was I, I was brought up in the port of Plymouth. It was quite often where those ex, exploratory journeys left from. It was the last port before they started, or one of the last ports before they started ha hitting the Atlantic. So they would often join their ships there, or the ships would be provisioned there. But there was a huge heritage of exploration, or certainly maritime exploration. So I think that was part of, you know, steeped in my childhood with stories of of people, of Sir Francis Drake and people, great explorers of their time, departing from you know from the, from the town I was brought up in. You know, for some reason, uh, the kind of uh, way you talk about this it brings you back to the uh, Canterbury Tales um, and. Uh, 
William Wallace from Scotland uh, with all his chivalry and um, the exploration and standing for a good. So would you say that your father was this figure for you, um, who at least initially inspired that in you? And did he actually take you to this expedition or something? No, my my father was a product of a post-war period, so where things were, you know, he was less able to have me on, on expedition. Also, he was uh, he was a ship's captain, so he was quite hard drinking and hard smoking and hard playing. So um, most, although that said, we did live um, both in Antigua, which is in the Caribbean, as part of my father's career when he was harbour master there, and then also he was a. Uh, a rig move coordinator so you know moving the the, the big oceanic sort of seagoing uh, ocean drilling rigs uh he was he moved them in the persian gulf so we did travel with him but it was a different type of travel it was much more of a seafaring type job travel we would follow it in his wake whereas for me um you know i'd i quite happily spend the next in fact this my next sort of solo trip when my daughter goes off to university is to walk to the walk from the anti atlas mountains in in morocco to the atlantic and there's nothing particular in that journey there's no like massive highlights going via any it's just it'll be a transition from the mountains to the sea and it'll be a cultural journey through places where people don't ever go and sort of meeting people off the beaten track and having a bit more of a having quite an authentic um expedition stroke journey i guess um let's talk a little bit about the preparation for these extreme um situations that um you yourself go to and then um you also help doctor experience um these situations and body is a machine that actually has to perform in these situations and to have a good machine um, you would have to take care of that also. Uh, and that comes with a lot of uh, dietary principles and restrictions and discipline. This is why we have actors. I remember uh, reading the book by Steve Sim, who is one of the celebrity trainers, and he talks about um, the analogy of body being a machine and how if you take care of your car, you should have to take care of your own body also. And then it comes with a lot of um, fashionable diets. So I was just wondering, what is your go-to strategy when it comes to coping up with different foods, different climates, different environments? Do you follow a specific diet like paleo or keto and carb <laughs> diet? How do it work for you? Typically, I have to say I eat what's there because um, I, in the type of trips that I'm in, so when we go um, dog sledding, we, we're quite often eating things like reindeer stew and potato stews because actually that's what is available locally. And also um, everything, when you sit it in your dog sled, everything gets frozen. So you need to have food you can unfreeze when you get to the tent or the uh, hunter's cabin, depending on where you're staying, but it needs to be freezable and then unfreezable because everything, as I said, everything freezes, even your lunch, you know, you know, firmus, by the end of the day, even the contents of the firmus are frozen. Um, so, yeah, that restricts what you can eat. And to be honest, I typically eat what's what's there locally. And when, you know, for instance, um, when I do the the journey in Morocco, that will be entirely Moroccan food, so tagines and, and food along the way. Um, I think you know the journey in itself is probably the the most healthy bit of it. And absolutely, you know, your body's a machine that you need to look afterwards. But actually, the fact that you're walking ten hours a day is part of that maintenance project. And it's, you know, for the first, I typically, I'm getting older now, but typically what I would find is the first two or three days can be quite difficult physically. But actually, as you get more and more used to walking, actually a lot of things improve. You know, your mental state improves because you're not getting constant deluge of phone calls and emails. But also, you know, you start to breathe easier, more easily. Your sense of balance gets much better because all of a sudden, you, you know, you're you're much aware of, where, aware of, of how and where you're walking in a way that when you're more sedentary at home you just don't need to be aware of um but in terms of special diets no typically i have to say because the type of journeys i've done i, I and as i mentioned right at the beginning i'm quite social i don't like doing massive solo journeys although with dogs would be okay because they are part of your you know sort of social network but typically i like journeys that are that go through villages and i get to meet people in the highlands of pakistan or get to meet the people in in the highlands of morocco for me that's the the type of expeditions i prefer to do rather than climbing to the top of everest or 
uh, spending a month skiing across Antarctica to get to the to the South Pole. So, and I appreciate why people do want to do those journeys. But uh, for me, one of the the degrees I didn't do, which I'd have loved to have done, and perhaps I still can, is a degree in social anthropology. So it's a way that society and people and the and the vast variety of cultures and differences between that that quite excites me. Mm. Yeah, I can remember you know when I was. <clears throat> Well, comparatively younger. So one of the books that actually inspired me uh, was Social Anthropology. I wanted to become an anthropologist. Um, and that was by um, Levi Strauss, uh, Tistus Topeka, that he wrote about um, first interactions um, in Brazil and rainforest with the um, original tribes. Um, but now what I want you to talk about is your impact on other people and how you have inspired and nurtured people um, who are just like you and compassionate who want to make a difference in life. Um, and um, you invite a lot of guests on your own podcast. Um, and one of them that I was uh, recently listening to was um, Nathan, who has been to Pakistan, has worked a lot um, in Himalayas in extreme weather. Now, um, as you probably already know, that um, 18 out of worst 20 highest uh, mountains are in Pakistan in Himalayas range. Um, K2 being the second is, and the most deadliest um, is there. Um, I was reading a book by Reinhold Messner, um, who's a German climber, he's probably the most uh, famous one, and he lost his brother on a mountain called Ananga Parpat, which is also known as Killer Mountain. And one of the things that I was reading in his uh, book is that cold weathers, height, um, and altitude, these things are not only a test for your physical strength, but also of your mental tenacity. And I think that's a very important point when we talk about extreme preparedness. Um, some of the things that you talked with Nathan um, give me an idea that how it's an important focus of your programs to give them the mental strength that one would require to cope up with situations which includes um, both um, the failure, the loss, um, the fear, um, the um, destitute um, environment, the wins, the disappointment. How do you actually prepare yourself and, of course, um, other people to cope up with situations that are more deadly in terms of um, human will and not in, not as dangerous physically? I think, um, for to my view, the success of a lot of things, actually, aside from expeditions, is, you know, it's 90% met mental attitude and 10% equipment. Um, so a huge degree of expedition success or operating in extremes or indeed in, in life just generally is down to mental attitude. But doctors on um, expeditions or working in extreme environments are, are, are faced with a particular set of challenges. Often to them falls the, the, um, the skills to save somebody's life or to stop them from dying. They're often in isolated so any decisions they make they have to literally live with you know they don't have most medics will be working within a support system you know they'll be working within a, a health system we're working within a clinic within a hospital you know there are other people there to catch mistakes to sense check decisions or to ask for advice but in an expedition environment often people are solo so they have to make those decisions all by themselves. And if it's the wrong one, they have to live with the consequences of that. So mental preparation is an extremely um, big part of, of how we approach this because you won't always make the right decision or the circumstances might well be beyond your control. And you end up not bringing everybody back that you left with. You know, And that is an extremely heavy weight for, for people to bear. Um, and I think the big thing about the preparation around that is feeding it. It doesn't make you unique. Other people will be feeding the same thing. And that actually is not a weakness in you. It's a very human reaction to, to react that way. That actually these feelings are common. They're not uncommon. And to a degree, it is a process that you need to, to go through. You know, if you have to deal with trauma or grief or 
delivering bad news. Um, these are all things that are very human, and actually, it's not just you, and it's not in, it's not sort of unique to you. These are things that can be need to be thought about and actually prepared for. And by addressing them and preparing them, you're already forewarned. It's um, rather than, um, it's not so much fear of the unknown. It's you know, it's it becomes a known, and therefore, whilst not easy to deal, to deal with, it becomes easier. Hmm. I guess you're right in the sense also that it is not only um, a challenge, um, challenging situation for people who are in that situation, but also um, it gives you a growing opportunity that if you overcome that one struggle that you would know that, you know, that wasn't larger than life and that builds character and tenacity um, and strength. So one of the things that you do on your journey, um, Jerry, I think need more people like you is the fundraising for um, the effort that you do. So tell us a little bit about um, how do you actually do that and uh, where does the funding go and um, what is the difference that you're making there? Well, I suppose in, in so much that was something that when I was running my expedition company, I focused almost entirely on. So we would run uh, essentially uh, expeditions that had a strong fundraising element to them. So we would be approached by, let's say, the International Red Cross, who said they wanted to to raise X number of pounds. You know, we might set up then a trek for them in the Himalayas where you know, people had to walk 100 kilometers over five days. So not impossible, but e neither was it easy. They would have to work hard to to achieve that challenge. Um, and people would get sponsored to do that. I mean, I'm not, I, I think it's a very particular sort of British thing that people get sponsored to go away and climb um, K, uh, Kilimanjaro or trek, you know, trek across Africa or what have you. Um, but in the process... We, we did a lot of trips, and over the 15-year period, we help, helped to raise almost over £100 million. Now, that was raised by the individual charities that went off to the charities, and the charities spent that money in in their operations. And, but what we provided was the uh, the expeditionary or the sort of skill base for those challenges to take place, you know, to make sure also all the, the fundraisers came back in one piece. And it was actually, the I guess, the birth of extreme medicine so much as I wanted to you know, operating a trip, you have a moral responsibility to make sure that the people you take are safe. But also if something does go awry, does go wrong, that you've got a, you know, a sufficient pool of resources and skills to get that person or those people out of that sort of danger and get them back home if, if, that, was, if that was the case. So that was... Um, yeah, it was an incredible period of time where we did, where we yeah helped to raise well, literally hundreds, of, tens of millions of pounds. Mm -hmm. And I think um, this is probably the reason that you have been so successful in nurturing a community. Um, now, or for ten years, um, you organize a conference, uh, which is the World Extreme Medicine Conference, and a very diverse set of people um, joined that. And this year, I think it's in twenty twenty one. Let me actually share that and. One of the things that I really about that is uh, the messages that you actually and get from um, a lot of uh, different people on the openings. Uh, we have had the um, distinct pleasure of recorded, receiving recorded messages from International Space Station. I was looking at one of those actually, and uh, it was from, just give me a second. Is this from Drew Morgan or Kate Rubins or? Yeah, this, that was Kate's. Sorry, I had, this is the wrong tab, I guess. So that's the Kate Rubin one. And uh, tell us how you actually got in touch with NASA and, and you know, your work there. Because I cannot think of any more extreme situation than this. <laughs> Well, do you know, it's very fortuitous in so much that um, an astronaut from NASA came and spoke at our conference. Um, and I think it was in our second year. Uh, it's a conference we ran at Harvard Medical School. Um, we, we changed Initially, we changed lo location each year. So we had it at the Royal Society of Medicine one year, Harvard Medical School another year. Anyway, uh, and a very gracious and interesting astronaut came and joined us, uh, Dr. Mike Barrett, who's a 
a flight surgeon as well as being an astronaut. Um, and I guess at the end of the day, we struck up a very strong relationship with Mike. Um, for Mike, the conference, one of the reasons we run the conference and have built this community is often the medical professionals, be they nurses, paramedics or doctors, who work in this type or are attracted to this type of uh, medicine, you know, they come from different silos. So they could be aviation medics or they could be humanitarian medics or they could be uh, emergency room medics, you know. But what we found is that people tended to be siloed. They either tended to be a mountain medic or they tended to be a military medic or they tended to be a humanitarian medic and never the twain met. But also the lessons that people were learning in these different silos were cross transferable and should have been and should be transferred in fact the speed of transference you know would speed up the improvement of remote medicine so we wanted to build a community where these people all met shared their common experiences shared their latest research but also networked so if you're a humanitarian medic and you wanted to go on an expedition you know you could find the person who or talk to the people that could help facilitate that or similarly, if you're an expedition medicine or tactical medic that wanted to work in a humanitarian setting, then you would find a pathway to do that. For NASA, what was useful for them is that blending all those different disciplines, because typically you would be an aviation and space medic. But actually, if you, you know, the type of, if something goes wrong on a spacecraft, you're in extreme cold vacuum, very hot, you know, everyone goes, it's those, you know, the expeditionary skills, you know, saving, uh, or rather, you know, being in a rocket ship going to the moon has a, you know, huge degree of similarity to setting off on a sea voyage. You know, you're in a pod, you've got limited resources, you've got a hostile and dangerous lethal environment on the other side of your, of your vessel, and you're reliant on your skills, what you have with you, and your ability often to, to problem solve. So those expeditionary skills is something that NASA has always been really strong at, strong on sort of promoting, but also the conference proves, uh, provides a perfect sort of community of those type of medics that are great for NASA to take into space because they're sort of problem solving, high, high performing, um, and they think across disciplines and they're not limited to just one. So where was like, where, how did we get there? So anyway, NASA had been involved from the second year in the conference. So consequently, it was one of those uh, surreptitious moments where I just thought, well, if I ask Mike, maybe we can organize that. And that's, um, and he very graciously set it up. And so we've had, I think we're on our seventh year of messages from the International Space Station. This year's conference is our 10th conference. And we're, we're and I, it's not confirmed, but we're planning something that takes that an even step further. So. You know, what's this space for what happens this year with NASA's interface to the conference? I think there's another place you might want to, you know, submit your proposal, which is Elon Musk SpaceX. Uh, even though it's a private entity, uh, you know, you might have some work there also to do. That would be interesting. So, so, yeah, so we wrote to Elon last last week. Oddly enough, in a very, very small world, um, I got invited to the Johnson Space Center in uh, in Texas, and I decided that I wanted to get stay in an Airbnb somewhere where I could walk to the Space Center rather than have to get a car or all that sort of stuff. Anyway, uh, I stayed with this lovely old lady just near Johnson Space Center who happened to be the mother of uh, the space director at SpaceX. So anyway, so we wrote to Elon last week. So we're kind of going to get our fingers crossed. I mean, he's a busy man, and he's got a lot of stuff going on. But yeah, fingers and crossed. Now the richest man also. <laughs> so again, and, and oh, now, now the richest man. Yes, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it would be it would be amazing. I mean, people complain that social media and the internet is a, is an echo chamber that you just hear the same voices coming back the whole time. So one of the things you want to do with the conference is not to do that is have voices that challenge our preconceptions and challenge the way that is the accepted way. So we actually get uh, voices that uh, give us a different story to the ones that we typically hear. So, you know, getting diversity and getting people like Elon Musk into into that in, 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 in community is extremely valuable because of course the people we're talking to now are the leaders of tomorrow so um getting people to think differently and, and imaginatively about a new future is important to us 
And, and one other thing that I think which takes you to the whole new level um, and which a lot of people find more uh, most inspiring with your work is, um, and I've read a lot of testimonials and videos uh, from people who have worked with you over the years. Um, and one thing that I find in common in all those uh, blazing reviews were was the fact that, you know, you made the job of a doctor way more glorious than it actually <laughs> is you know what they do is they go to a medical ward nine to five so there's a time to go but there's no time to come back and there's a lot of disappointment it's to be honest quite a thankless job and it's one routine and you do it again and again and you at some point it drives you and i've had a conversation with a lot of people um, who work in uh, medical field for such a long time and it, it drives you to kind of uh, sort of insensitive callous uh life mode where it, death is part of uh life extreme medicine takes them out of that environment you know put them to extreme um, situations in where they actually make difference um in more parts of the world where they actually have to challenge not only themselves but other people's preconceptions about what medicine can do um, and through that experience they also learn uh what is what is empathy and compassion? Um, and that is something that you are now bringing to uh, to an intersection of both media and medicine. Um, you've worked with uh, Bear Grylls also. And I don't think, if, I don't know if that's a British thing because there's another guy also. Uh, I just got forgot his name. He's also from, he's a British um, services guy, some some guy named Myers or something. I've seen his lot of his videos. Oh, Ray, uh, Ray Myers, Ray Myers. Ray Myers, exactly. So I don't know if that's an English thing, but you know, there's a lot of uh, extreme weather situations um, um, that are dealt by this English guy. So uh, tell us, what was your experience with um, Bear Grylls? Um, I have personally been inspired uh, while I was preparing for my journeys um, from his videos. I think um, what makes the difference here is living on a wet, cold island makes you quite hardy. And I was going to say, when I was dog sledding, there was an occasion rather when I was dog sledding, and it was constantly minus twenty. But it's the water's, you know, the water's frozen, so you've got your clothing on, and you're being quite active, and you've got enough food going in. So, but you're remaining dry inside essentially. Um, and I did that trip minus 20 came back to the uk and then went straight to do a climbing course in winter and it was plus three but it was raining and it was damp and it was foggy as you mentioned the fog before and actually to be honest it was cold and miserable and far more taxing than being in minus 20 because the water was inside you the whole time you can never quite dry off and you were always always cold so i think that kind of does make make for uh robustness because it's just wet and cold the whole time and you just need to get on with it um, um we yeah, we worked i'm not sure where the program's out at the moment so i'm not sure i can say too much but anyway we supported bear grills on one of his recent uh, man against wild filming projects um and which which was an incredible experience and uh, he also spoke at the or did a pre-recorded um presentation for last year's conference as well you know but he's a man that's achieved um uh, his dreams of adventure sort of turned into uh, into into his life as well in this sort of work. So I think I think nobody starts medicine uh, wanting to work in a thankless job, which is tiring, exhausting, within hospital walls where you don't often see the sun. That's not why people take up medicine. They take up medicine generally because they care about people and they want to uh have a career that delivers some status but also is meaningful and has impact positive impact on people's lives and i think all too often people do exactly get as you said trapped in that kind of cycle of you they have to do the next exam or they have to do the next qualification to go up the medical ladder and it constrains them to hospital work or or clinic work but actually there are so many more doctors out there who want to use their you know, their fantastic medical training for the betterment of other people. And expeditions in extreme medicine and humanitarian work, you know, give them the ability to balance a clinical career with a medicine which is perhaps truer to the original values that they joined medicine in the first place with. Um, and I think it's entirely healthy to have that variety. And I think I suspect, or anecdotally, we suspect that actually doctors who undergo these types of experiences return to their normal clinical career 
actually better doctors because they've learned teamwork and they've learned empathy they've learned how to innovate and problem solve because they you know in the places they're working there isn't any equipment tray they then they have to make do with what's there um and they would have rediscovered the joy or the passion for medicine that they they might well have lost in that kind of attrition of of the of their career so no from from my point of view and we've had it said to us it's hard to prove quantifiably but we think we it improves people's medical careers because it gives them a, a, a balance and also gives their medicine real purpose when they're out in remote areas. Mm -hmm. I think you're right there that you know a doctor has to you know, do a lot of delayed gratification in order to study for such a long time and then um, doing the practice and then there's always a new exam and you know internal medicine residency or whatever field there is. So the, you know they they have a very um muffled sense of enjoyment and uh curiosity um that they want to regain at some point in their life um and you know we we're only valuing their services when there's there are times like this which is COVID 19 uh, when we really you know find how important their services are and what they do and you know they spend a lot of uh, their time doing these things um and giving them this opportunity to actually glorify um the kind of job that they do um i think that's such a wonderful thing you also um are in preparation i don't know how much you can talk about that um the paramount studios new movie uh, mission impossible that's um due later this year well we can't say it too much but yeah but we have been fortunate to are fortunate to work with paramount so we're working with on as you said mission impossible but also another a, a range of other productions including jack Ryan, the, the tv series and then films that are becoming into production so um one of the one of the things one of the benefits of extreme medicine is those doctors who are now being called on to deal with the covid you know if you've done extreme medicine then often you would have responded to that and done that type of work elsewhere in the Ebola epidemics or cholera outbreaks you know so it brings of it brings a pool of skills and experience which then become really useful when you're dealing with covid 19 which is one of the reasons um paramount engages us is because of our depth of knowledge of responding to pandemics um clearly the ones before were were you know further away but these are you know this is this is very close to everybody and having that pool of knowledge is now is is really quite is quite useful i mean there's lots of experience and knowledge built up because obviously the pandemic's been going for quite a while now but initially certainly extreme medics were one of the few groups of people that had that knowledge because of their experiences working in, as I said, working in a, Ebola outbreaks or Mars and SARS outbreaks. Uh, Mark, if there's only one place that you have to choose uh, and not home, where would you live? Oh, that's a good, where would I live? Do you know, a desert by, this, by a sea that was warm with mountains in the background with my kids nearby would, would be perfect. So, that's um, like yeah. putting everything together <laughs> in one place yeah there isn't one single place the thing is that when people ask me what's your favorite place it's impossible to say because each place you have a very different experience and you know for, for you know you know i get fascinated by the namib desert and just i could spend weeks there just looking at stuff because there's so much there but it's all hidden away you know the little beetles and the, and the large mammals you get there but then when you go to the Moroccan mountains and you get the hospitality and the food and the culture and the history, and, you know, it's just there isn't one place that really uh, stands out as being amazing because they're all amazing, but in different ways. So for me personally, though, the only thing, and I live by the sea now, I couldn't not live by the sea now. So being able to see water is an essential part of, and that's, you know, I'm actually pretty easily pleased, actually. So I just need to be somewhere where it doesn't rain all the time and where it is, by the sea and if that sea was swimming uh, warm enough to swim in every day then i'd be then that would be enough i mean you seem to be very um kind and extroverted so like to connect with other people um i remember when covid 19 set in a lot of introverts like yes that's like dream come true um, but i guess yeah. it's it's very opposite for um people like you and i was just wondering how are you actually coping with the restriction of not being able to fly you know talk to a lot of people that you really do and i guess that's the same for a lot of people that you interact with and work with so how, how does it actually you know 
and crushes your free spirit. <laughs> yeah, I think it's um, I think it's hard for lots of people, and I'm a, I'm aware that I'm extremely lucky. So we live on the on a World Heritage coastal site. So we have we have unlimited space around us and and the coast. There there aren't. Um, so I can walk for four or five hours and not see anybody, not see a soul. So I have space and we're able to exercise. And actually, it's really quite hilly around here. I reckon that during lockdown, I've probably done the equivalent of going up and down Everest a couple of times because it is so, so steep and so hilly around here. So it has been odd not traveling. But I think actually we have that's not a bad thing. I think the, the carbon footprint of the human race was getting quite excessive. I don't think it's an entirely bad thing if if some of the travel behaviours of our species were curtailed somewhat, you know, uh, and our carbon footprint was reduced. I think we have a unique opportunity in our generation lifetime to perhaps put some of those measures in place. I think also people have the way that they interact has changed. People are more used to doing, you know. Uh, podcasts and interviews and zoom calls like this and you know people have learned a new way of learning i think that's very positive and i think for some of the larger companies where historically you had to go work in the office perhaps they've seen their productivity actually increase because people aren't having to spend their time commuting generating carbon gases but actually are producing just as much at home working you know, the other big thing for me Manash, is that and i'm not sure how lockdown is working for you guys over in pakistan india but the uk during the summer closed down almost its entirety so i had my kids home i had my kids home for for nine months they were absolutely sick of it but i loved it because you know they're at university i never expected to get that at home time with them again because they've grown and flown the nest so for them to be here was yeah it was that was quite special and that's something i think i'll look back with a very uh sort of um nostalgic eyes actually so it hasn't entirely been uh hasn't all been positive but actually i know that i'm in a very, in a very fortunate position both in terms of where i live and the job that i can do because i can do that virtually so um i feel very blessed for that and i know other people's lives aren't quite so easily placed but yeah i've actually quite enjoyed it i'm getting to the point now where there's some expeditions i want to get off and do but i think you know, given that other people's lives have, have uh, been changed much more dramatically by the by the disease, I think I can just wait and be patient and wait for the it to be got under control. I think as collective um, human, our collective human conscious has grown a lot uh, during this um, COVID nineteen, and we have learned a lot of things that you know uh, we probably don't need as much interaction on carbon. Uh, footprint uh, to be able to efficient and work together. A lot of companies, um, even when the restrictions are relaxed, you know, they have started to uh, work or to continue to work remotely. And in, in many situations, it's very good. A lot of industries have boomed, uh, which weren't actually uh, prospering before, before COVID-19. So there are, of course, pros and cons for everything. Um, if you were to write a book about your life, what would be your most important contribution to humanity what, what do you think it's you're most proud of i think um the the growth of i'm not sure i you know i would uh i would weigh my contribution quite that largely so heavily but i think the the growth of the internet and our judicious use of it has allowed us to break down uh break down boundaries and create communities that are wholly beneficial in terms of the medicine. You know, there's knowledge used to sit within these bastions of medicine, you know, kind of the raw society of this or the authority of that. You know, the internet's allowed us to to break away from that. And actually we can choose a passion and, um, you know, and if we're imaginative and passionate enough, we can create new futures. And I think, that's what we've been, I guess, I guess in terms of medicine, although as I, said, I don't think of what my legacy is being so grand as that, but I think it's breaking down some of those silos, making this type of medicine accessible for lots of medical professionals. And through the, the master's program and other programs is actually generating new research. So not only does do more people get involved in this and the quality of those people get improved because they're better prepared and better trained, but also the science of remote medicine also Consequently, consequently, also gets improved, and you know, and lives are uh, made better as a result. 
how would you um, rather people remember you as? Well, I'm not sure I need remembering, to be honest, Mitch. It's just making a, it's making a contribution when you're alive, isn't it? So how would I want to be remembered? Actually, to be honest, fondly, I guess, would be the words. I'd hope my kids would think of me you know, with, with fondness rather than saying, oh, God, thank God, thank God he's gone, grumpy old git. So fondness, I think, probably would be the way. I think that's the sweetest response for the question like this. And finally, if you could relive your life, uh, is there anything you would change? You know, I think you're the master of your own destiny. And the only regrets you ever have are making are, are not saying yes to stuff. And I've been very fortunate to say yes to lots of stuff. Um, so, no, I think, you know, you can't, I, I don't think you can live life with regrets. You have to live life completely positively. Um, and, you know, and like everybody, and certainly there are lots of people listening to this have had much more significant challenges. But, you know, you get to a certain age and you will have had inevitably significant uh, challenges, whether that's deaths or, deaths or close pe of uh, people who are close to you. But you have to look on the other side and you have to look forward and you have to always have to look positively and you can't look into the past because that makes who you are. But the, you know, as they, as they say, you should be embarrassed of who you are now when you look back at yourself in three years time. So, you know, every day should be a journey forward. Uh, Mark, it, it's, uh, it's a sad situation that you, uh, we'd have to let you go. Um, it would have been such wonderful if uh, we could have more um, longer conversation with you. And uh, hopefully that's going to be a start of a series of conversations um, between us. Um, as a last note, uh, if there is a 20 year old version of you, um, listening to you and other Mark can afford um, somewhere around the world, um, what would you tell yourself? Uh, an astronaut. It'd be nice to be <laughs> 20 years time looking down at me. Oh yeah, looking down from space saying hello. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you so much, Mark. It's been an utter pleasure having you. Um, more power to you. You're doing great work. And we definitely need more people like you. Um, keep doing the contribution, making the contribution that you are. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Manash, for your kind words. And thank you for your audience, for their patience. And lovely to talk to you too. Have a nice evening. Bye. Bye-bye.